Oh, no, you can leave it. it I, I've hidden it, so it's fine. I'll turn you back on. You'll see yourself, but I'll turn you back on when it comes. All right. Ready, Scott? Yep, I'm all set. Here we go. I've decided to show my support for the Daily Tech News Show. Well, how could this have been done? Simple. All I did was go to patreon.com slash acedetect and pledge a dollar a month. Hey, it's only a dollar for some awesome content. Value for value, right? Go ahead and take it away, Tom. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, June 3rd, 2015. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me as he does most Wednesdays, Mr. Scott Johnson, founder of the Frog Pants Network, the morning stream and more. How you doing, Scott? I'm doing really well today, Tom. Thank you so much. It's uh, Wednesday is quickly becoming at least my most technical day, if not my favorite. Uh, we've got a really good show today because we're going to be talking about something called Named Data Networking. And we've asked Dr. Li Xia Zhang, a professor of computer science at UCLA, to join us after the headlines uh, and, and explain this to us. It, it is a, a project that I think it has the potential to solve a lot of problems with the way the Internet is used, the uh, way the Internet is operated. And uh, we'll get to that in a moment. But let's start with some headlines. The Electronic Privacy Information Center honored Apple CEO Tim Cook at an event Monday. Cook gave a speech and a half. Uh, TechCrunch reports Cook said Apple rejects the idea that, quote, customers should have to make trade-offs between privacy and security. He said morality demands it. He took a swipe at companies that are gobbling up everything they can learn about you and trying to monetize it, saying, quote, we think that's wrong. But he saved his strongest rhetoric for the U.S. government, saying weakening encryption or taking it away harms good people that are using it for the right reasons. And ultimately, I believe it has a chilling effect on our First Amendment rights and undermines our country's founding principles. He even quoted Abraham Lincoln saying, America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we falter and lose our freedoms, it will be because we destroyed them ourselves. Yeah. A lot of people are focused, and Scott, mostly on the Facebook and Google swipe at the beginning of this, but I think the strongest part of the speech was his call that encryption is a right. Yeah, it's also intense. Um, I, I'm not sure everyone expected a, a, you know, an event like this. This is sort of set up to honor him and others for him to get up and, and give this impassioned kind of kind of speech about things that I think are really important to a lot of people right now. So yeah, pretty good stuff. I really enjoyed reading the whole thing. Uh, VentureBeat reports that fix, or Skype has fixed, which is great, a flaw that crashes Skype when you receive the characters HTTP colon slash slash colon. Don't try it right now, folks. You may still be uh, having an issue. In fact, uh, once you got that message, Skype crashed any time you tried to sign in. The bug appeared on Windows, Android, and iOS, but apparently not Skype for the Mac or for the Windows tied interface, or tiled interface, rather. In less than 24 hours, though, Skype fixed the bug, so... Make sure to head to skype.com slash download and uh, your mobile phone app store. Get that thing updated right now. You do not want to be crashed by Skype. No, I'm glad they fixed it fast, though. I was very impressed by that. Yeah. TechCrunch reports Cisco and IBM have both acquired OpenStack companies. OpenStack is an open source project that enables users to create their own cloud services, often used in what is called the private cloud. Uh, that's where you have cloud services, but they're only available inside your enterprise. Cisco announced it has purchased private cloud company Piston Cloud Computing, and IBM has acquired private cloud service provider Blue Box. Now, a lot of open source folks are feeling like OpenStack is now in the hands of the corporations, and they're a little, if not upset, sentimental about that. Mm. Recode reports Apple's Beats has voluntarily recalled the Beats Pill XL speakers. I had a pair of these at one point, briefly. After eight reports of overheating, Beats has sold more than 200,000 of the speakers since November of 2013. Speakers can be identified by a lowercase b on the speaker grill and the words Beats Pill XL on the handle. Apple's urging people to go to apple.com slash support slash beats dash pill XL dash recall <laughs> for details on how to return those things and get your $325 back. It's expensive, man. 
Yeah. Uh, and just a straight on recall, we're going to give you money. I mean, they'll offer you store credit too, because uh, they would rather have you just give the money right back to them. But uh, yeah, that's that's a bad one. Now, it's not like it's catching on fire or anything. I guess they burned somebody's finger, uh, kind of kind of scarred or charred a desktop, uh, but nothing to mess around with. Isn't also, sure. this is post uh, purchasing of Beats, right? So this is before Apple had them and they're, they're t- fixing a problem. I, I think that's... Yeah, true. Apple's fixing a problem that was created in the manufacturing before Apple owned Beats. Gotcha. We blame Dr. Dre. PC, no, we don't. We definitely don't. Take it back. In case Dre is listening, he's not listening. PCMag.com reports that AMD announced its sixth generation processors, codenamed Carrizo, in A8, A10, and FX series models. The A8 and A10 APUs feature 10 compute cores, four CPU cores, plus six GPU cores. And the FX series APUs feature a total of 12 compute cores, four CPU and four GPU. The chips use heterogeneous systems architecture, or HSA, does sharing the workload and the system memory between the CPU and the GPU rather than having the CPU do all the directing. The A8 and A10 processors get R6 graphics and the FX series R7 graphics. When paired with the discrete graphics card, both the R6 or the R7 APUs will work in conjunction with that discrete GPU to boost graphics performance. Look for laptops with A series APUs coming this month. I was going to say portables, laptops, um you know, small fanless Chromebook type arrangements seem well, that seems like they'll benefit greatly from this, uh, this stuff. All right. A few more stories before we finish up here. News from you comes at our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Get in there and join folks in voting things up and voting them down. Metal Freak sent us this story from Ars Technica. At long last, Microsoft is bringing SSH, a.k.a. Secure Shell, to Windows and PowerShell. Uh, Until now, Windows lacked any native SSH client server. However, the Windows PowerShell team has announced Microsoft will work with and contribute to OpenSSH, the standard for SSH implementation, to Unix to add that functionality to Windows. This will let Unix, Linux, and Windows machines securely access each other. Scott, the Linux Windows war is pretty much over now. Where's the parade? Let's go down by near Central Park and rejoice. This is wonderful news. Yeah. I don't think that war's over. Star Fury Zeta submitted the Engadget article that the U.S. state of Virginia has marked 70 miles of highway in the northern part of the state as, quote, Virginia Automated Corridors. This allows companies who have received approval for their cars to do public road testing of self-driving cars, Google and the like, uh, Nokia uh, here mapped division, or sorry, mapping division will develop 3D maps for the road tests or for these test roads. That's pretty awesome. The fact that you're getting actual governments, actual municipalities interested in supporting this research because that's going to be huge to ever happening and for roads ever being, you know, self-driving at all. And more places uh, to test Virginia, different parts of the Virginia government providing some support, including some insurance. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, The more places they have to test, uh, the better the cars will get, we hope. Cross your fingers. Doris Rio submitted the TechCrunch report that augmented reality device Magic Leap has launched a development platform. Chief Creative Officer Graham Devine announced it on stage at the MIT Technology Review's M-Tech Digital Conference. A developer section of the website has been launched where you can sign up for the SDK. You don't get it yet, though. That's coming soon. They need you to sign some NDAs, I think. CEO Ronnie Abovitz also said the company is out of the R&D phase. So they're transitioning Magic Leap to be a real product. Oh, and they had author Neil Stevenson on stage to help convince you this is, in fact, the real world arrival of the metaverse. That's pretty awesome. Um, We haven't seen a lot of Neil Stevenson lately, it feels like. It feels like it's uh, been a while since his big Kickstarter and that whole sword thing. And I thought, well, where the heck is he? And this is right where we need him because this stuff is awesome. Yeah, he's helping out with Magic Leap. And, of course, he has a book out, Seven Eves, uh, just came out. Uh, which I am eagerly waiting to read, but I have to finish uh, the latest at James S.A. Corey first. And that's a look at the headlines. All right, joining us uh, now, very uh, appreciative to have Dr. Lixia Zhang, professor of computer science at UCLA, uh, who is working on the Named Data Networking Consortium. Thank you for joining us, doctor. Oh, hi. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> so... I read an article uh, a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago, uh, about named data networking. Uh, I want you to grade me 
Uh, help me do a better job at describing it. Uh, here, here's, here's what I've been telling people. Right now, data is found by location. If I want a web page, I tell my browser the server it's on, and the browser goes and requests the data from that server. Named data networking seems to me to be the idea that requests for things like web pages name, and then the network sort of asks around to see which is the closest machine that has the data I want. So how would I do? Is that is that close? It's very close. Um, but I think the real story can be even simpler. Uh, because like you said, when you try to uh, visit a web page, uh, the, uh, what, we, what happened today is that, that the URL contains a name, the DNS name, which first get translated into IP address, and then you go to that specific computer to get the data. So all um, NDN is doing is to remove that translation step. Instead, you just ask the, the system to say, here's the, the content I want, and you leave all the freedom to the system, I mean the network, to find out where uh, the nearest copy of that desired content uh, would be. Uh, could be cached somewhere, could be produced uh, by the original uh, server, depending on what you're asking. Uh, but uh, the freedom is left to the system, rather than for your brother uh, to specifically name an IP address to get the data from. So your browser has to know less uh, it just yeah. needs to know what the name of the data is, but why would, why would we need that? You already have it. You just said that. You look at the URL, and it has a name in it. So, um, in the end, really, to trying to uh, get the system actually simpler uh, by cutting off the unnecessary step of translating into addresses. Do you also speed up the process of getting the data because you're, you're making the request for the data and because it doesn't have to go, let's say, to a server in Japan to get it because that's where the file is, is sitting on a, on a server that you've had to call through the browser. Instead, you're saying, oh, a copy of this, an exact copy of this, or this exact file is somewhere in Texas. It's much closer in a server that's more, you know, closer to your network. Therefore, it's going to pull from the closest one are we saving bandwidth as well, as, as well as increasing the speed at which we get our data back? You are exactly right. Yes, there's a savings in multiple uh, fronts. Um, so you leave the freedom, like I said, to the network to decide, and uh, this reduce the complexity, um, reduce the uh, resource consumption, as well as increase the security. So how do you increase the security? Because if I'm understanding it, the data could be on a, a neighboring computer uh, of any kind. Uh, yeah. It seems to me that, that, that some people might hear that and say, well, that sounds less secure to me. Yes, that can be the impression. But uh, if you look at the, the finer print, um, every piece of name the packet will also carry a signature. So the name the data uh, networking design, size size. Every piece of data upon the production, it will be uh, sealed. That is sealed by a signature that binds the name to its contents. And therefore, no third party could possibly modify it without being detected. So, so what, if you, what if you have two versions of that Let's call it a file. You're talking about packets, obviously, but if we're talking about, let's say it's a, an image file, a JPEG file, and it resides on five different actual physical servers around the world, mm -hmm. and this is the one closest to us, is it, does it have a way of verifying that this is an exact 100% copy of, of the file you actually need? In other words, is, will it be possible for somebody to, to mess with that and you end up getting packets from a file that, it, that don't match the one you're actually looking for? Well, as long as the crypto has not failed, the signature is reliably binding the name to the data. Uh, so, uh, like I said, I don't do crypto, but uh, as long as the crypto works, um, that danger is not there. That is, there's a modified contents without uh, detection. That should not happen. You mentioned something earlier 
which is what if, uh, say, even for the image file, you could uh, do some editing and produce a new image. For that, in the end, has this a very simple idea. That is, once data is produced, it never changes. If you make it changes, you produce a new version. So every single piece of data is immutable. So and an updated web page would have a new name then, essentially? Um, as a new version. Like, for example, cnn.com front page. It's still cnn.com front page. But uh, based on when it is produced, um, the timestamp of the production time would be part of the name so that you can easily you know, visit, say, you know, yesterday's page versus today's page. Today actually is not so easy. You can say, I want to look at the cn.com three days ago. Um, it's not immediately clear how you request uh, that page. But then you know, we'll make it very easy and very clear exactly uh, which, which days of the news you're actually looking at. Now, that's a lot of names to have to keep track of. And I, as I understand it, that is one of the challenges is how to efficiently handle a namespace that large. How, how, is that, how do you think that is going to be done? Uh, talk about the namespace. Uh, we should understand that today's applications are actually all in the namespace. Uh, this is basically the main name system namespace. Uh, the top level names are handled by the ICANN. There is a well-established uh, name governance system. There's an entirely separate issue of you know, whether we can do something better than the existing system. But uh, name space governance is a separate um, technical question, a political question combined, uh, but that's not the architecture part of the question. It's exactly the same like today's uh, internet architecture, which is uh, TCP IP based data delivery. If you look at uh, the architectural uh, defining documentation, which is the RFC 791 IP specification, that only specifies how the IP packet looks like. So therefore, all the IP boxes, uh, your routers, your hosts, your smartphones, all understand um, every packet we, we received and every packet, how they format it to send it so other machines can understand it. But the RFC 791 doesn't say a single bit on how IP address should be allocated. So that's an entirely separate uh, part of the system Sure. which is necessary, um, but not part of the architecture. So you can think of NDN is exactly the same thing. We define the format of the packet exchanges, so therefore all the machines speaking NDN will be able to exchange packets. But um, namespace governance uh, belongs to a separate uh, system, not Still part of the architecture. Still seems like some pretty big routing tables might be needed, though. Um, that's correct. Uh, so we have developed uh, various different approaches to address the routing scalability question. So uh, work is ongoing, and we actually explore uh, very different uh, designs. Now, one way we know exactly how to do is actually to um, just a copying what has been done with uh, IP routing. Use the similar protocols, but uh, replacing IP prefixes with the name prefixes. Uh, like, for example, today, if you want to reach CNN, you just uh, translate cn.com to a, actually a set of IP addresses, because you have to do load balancing and this and that. Um, the, uh, we can just uh, announce a CNN out, um, and the network itself actually can figure out if the CNN website is replicated. The system takes the responsibility to handle your request uh, by the nearest uh, replica. And as a as an end user, this is all. This should all be pretty seamless. What what are the implications for somebody who's just 
surfing the web? What do they see immediate improvement? Do they notice hardly anything at all? Is this you know purely just a structural thing that that they go on with their lives and never notice? I think as the end users, the, I hope they will see actually um, improved performance, and I hope they will have less um, like uh, the, the phishing attacks and um, other issues. I think for the end users, there should be all the benefits. Um, yeah, if you were encrypt encrypting all the things, that would make sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. So everything is signed. Um, therefore, you know, if you uh, receive the spam message, which you should, which you shouldn't. But uh, the that the name will not match the key that should be used to sign that website, and therefore your browser will not be fooled to visit the phishing site. Um, oh, that's interesting. I hadn't considered that. So basically, you're creating this is the more secure part. I was trying to get my head around um, as it applies to end users anyway. This idea that the data itself is no longer anonymous. The, the, the people can be, the, the creators can be anonymous, but the data can't be anonymous anymore, can it? Oh, it can. It can if it's necessary. Uh, yeah. When necessary, you can really create this kind of uh, anonymous publication system where you know, the computer science people keep seeing one level of interaction uh, can solve all the problems. So therefore, you could have anonymous publishing system where the real publisher can hide uh, their real identity while the contents will be signed by this anonymous publishing um, system mm -hmm. so that the system itself can actually verify the, uh, the producers, um, the uh, credentials, but the system will assure that the false uh, contents will not propagate through. Like you know, today, there's so much malicious stuff going on in the right. internet uh, where very naive home users could easily get fooled. Uh, we want to uh, just uh, block that uh, that whole that, that uh, vulnerability. Now, obviously, there's a lot of businesses that have have built their business on the idea of IP routing and, and the uh, natural advantages that that system might give them. Uh, in addition, it certainly seems like a Herculean task to change the fundamental layers upon which the Internet runs. What, what do you think are the challenges that you need to overcome for name data networking to actually become the way we run the Internet? Um. Yeah, I hate to say this. I'm really old, so therefore, I actually went to witness how IT came out. Uh, when I walked into graduate school, that was exactly the year TCP/IP specification came out. Um, I remember I walked into MIT. My advisor, David Clark, handed me the specification, saying that it's a hot of print. Read it. At that time, very few people. Uh, knew about this entirely new revolution of the communication systems. Uh, how did the TCP/IP eventually uh, get rolled out? It's only one simple sentence: applications drive that network revolution. In the early days, uh, email was you know the hot application that everybody wanted email, and that really uh, provided the driving force for the IP uh, deployment. So I think uh, fundamentally, in the end, I haven't had a uh, chance to explain more details about why applications uh, would uh, be much easier to develop on top of NDN. But it's really uh, the benefit of facilitating application development. I think that will drive the NDN rollout. We want to have traffic. We don't have to worry about anything else. Yeah. Yeah, obviously, obviously, we have uh, so much more that we could talk about related to NDN than we have time for today. If someone's interested in learning more about it or even developing uh, for it, where, where should they go? Oh, go to our website, um, name the dash data.net, uh, where we are continuously publishing new uh, stuff. There's uh, all the history of the the project, um, our initial research proposal submitted to uh, NSF back in the year 2010 
and our uh, annual report of the progress. Uh, our code base, we are doing this entirely open source development. We really are welcome and really appreciate um, everyone who's willing and interested to come and join our effort. Uh, we're using their standard open source development system. Uh, so go to our website, and all the pointers are there. Uh, we already had, um, we currently have uh, like about 30 nodes test bed. Although the number is small, that's actually cross continents, uh, stretching from Europe to North America to uh, Asia Pacific region, uh, connecting up a number of um, research institutions as well as uh, a few industry labs uh, who are interested in participating in the NDHEN research. That's named-data.net. Uh, Dr. Zhang, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to talk with us about this. This is a fascinating thing for me, and I know a bunch of people watching in the chat room were saying the same thing. They wanted to pass along their thanks as well. Oh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to spread the word. That Absolutely. I'm yeah. My job is to propagate words so more people will know about it. Well, it's, uh, you're doing a good job. <laughs> it was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. All right, take care. Uh, so, Scott, uh, before we get on to our, our pick of the day, uh, what, what do you think? Are you in I, I got to tell you, dude, it's weird. I'm having a weird moment here where it feels like I don't want to get too much hyperbole around this thing, but I feel it feels like reading about this and studying about it over the last week or so and now hearing her talk about it. I am more and more convinced that this, at the very least, is the underpinnings of something new later, whether it's this exact structure as they've laid it out or something else will come of this, but there's something about this. This just feels ground level to me, and that's super exciting, and I don't feel like there's there's been that many opportunities in the way the Internet works to talk about that. There's all this talk in the in the 90s of Internet 2 and the, how, what that was going to be, and and it's kind of nice to see that just structurally speaking, we're talking about something this kind of this groundbreaking, and it's very exciting. So for whatever well, reason, I'm excited. I still don't totally understand, but I'm I'm excited about it. Well, do you understand it more than you did before? Oh yeah, by much more. And 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 it and it also what the thing I think I'm coming away with here was, it's one thing to say, hey, I have a new idea for how the internet should work, which is a, a, akin to saying, hey, all that copper wire you guys just laid, pull that out because we're going to put something new in. It's a big change when you propose ideas like that. What's what I like about the, what this sounds like is it sounds like it's not going to change too much fundamentally about how we use things. Right. You don't and, have to pull out the copper wire. Right. You don't have to. You can, you can apply this in ways that make sense for everybody from CDNs down to an end user and make it, make it work. And if it's that much more efficient, that much more secure, uh, that's super exciting. And I just, I don't know, I, I feel like the internet has become the thing it was and then we've just sort of used it to death and created all the applications in the world. And maybe it's time to actually address what its future is beyond you know, what it has been for the last 20 years. It's very exciting to me. No, I agree with you. Uh, reading about this and information-centric networking, uh, which was Van J Jacobson, who's working on name data networking, his, his theorization, uh, his famous speech a few years ago, uh, makes me think that if it's not this, it's something very like this or something that comes out of this uh, that helps us figure out how to solve. I mean, we didn't even get into it, but there are implications on net neutrality that make it less of an issue. Uh, there's obviously the things about security that we talked about. So I, I will be following this as well. And I know uh, there's folks out there who have the skills to contribute to this, and I encourage you to do so, named-data.net. Our pick of the day comes from Devalu who calls himself or herself genius from the West. Uh, here is another one for you, and it's a Chrome extension. If you're like me and you use Google Chrome with many extensions, each for a different purpose and want to manage them easily, try Simple EXT Manager. Features include a basic function to enable and disable, access options, and uninstall extensions by pop-up. Customize the pop-up to work better for you. Uh, create extension groups so you, you don't have the one big long list. And enable and disable dist extension groups through the pop-up and a right-click menu. So you can enable a group all at once, and then when you're done with it, disable the whole group. Uh, he says it's nothing much, but sure saves a lot of time and is way better than the Chrome extensions page, which is a little unwieldy if you have more than a few extensions. Mm -hmm. So check that out. It's called Simple EX Team Manager. Thank you, Devalu, for sending that. You can send your picks to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com, and you can find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. 
Mike M wrote in and said, I'm finally getting around to episode 2497, where you talked with Lamar Wilson about how YouTube would rather you watch videos from their recommended list instead of subscribing to a creator and binge watching. They do make it pretty difficult to binge watch a single creator. I find myself manually adding videos to the watch list later than moving them from there into a new playlist when playing that playlist. After enough of that every day, because I watch a lot of YouTube, he says, I decided to write a little script that does all that for me. You can specify a user, and it will automatically add any new videos as they're released to the end of the associated playlist in your account. If there's anyone in your audience who would benefit from this, have them send me an email, and I'll get them set up. We'll have the email uh, in the show notes, but it's Mike M M I K E M dot E X E plus Y T at gmail.com. Uh, awesome. What a cool yeah. thing. Um, it reminds me of podcasting, except for YouTube. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I, it, obviously, this is going to benefit people in front of computer screens, not so much mobile users, not so much um, people who can't run that kind of scripting on Roku's and things like that. But, but man, this is a huge boon for something that is kind of, quite frankly, a big pain in the butt when you want to watch somebody's channel. So this is great. David says hello from hot and rainy Florida. The new Broadwell CPUs are an interesting shift for Intel, David writes. They are for the most part uninteresting for workstations and high-end gaming. The CPU performance is lower than the current Haswell CPUs because they run at a lower clock speed. For other users, though, they are very important because they offer very good graphics performance and much better OpenCL performance than the Haswell CPUs. As more programs make use of OpenCL, I expect to see more computing power shifting to the GPU and OpenCL from your traditional CPU. Of course, when Silver Lake comes out and we get a die shrink, the clock speed should shoot back up. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think he, he makes a great point here, which is this round of Haswell is less about here's the most powerful thing and more about mobile Intel would like you to say, but I think David's pointing out uh, it just brings some more power to the middle to where you don't have to be spending on the top level thing. Well, we are heading into this science fiction place that I, I think is a good thing where the middle is where we're going to be on a daily basis. That's where we're all going to fun kind of function. We don't need to be concerned so much with, well, this isn't enough power to run what I have. We'll just have things that run things we want. And this just feels like steps toward that utopian ideal. Well, and it, it does jive with what AMD announced today, too, where they're saying, hey, we're going to have basically the, the, our APU, which is G, GPU and CPU on one, uh, you know, in one area, uh, working together. On, we're not going to make the CPU handle everything and then assign it off uh, to graphics processing. So, yeah, and yeah. I think you even said before, and I, I have agreed that, you know, we're going to get to a place where, like vinyl records for people who love to collect those things, people are going to want high-end workstations for certain very specific tasks. We are going to get to a place where the middle ground is the every ground and it's going to involve whatever the interfaces are, be them tablets or something we can't think of right now or kiosks in public or whatever they are. They're going to need to be in a place where it doesn't feel like junk, but they don't have to be these screaming machines that are meant for something else. And, and, and I'm, I think I'm okay with that. I used to not be okay with that, but I'm okay with it now. Thank you for the email, David. And thanks to everybody who sends us emails. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You guys are great. Uh, we always get more than, than we really can fit in any particular show. So we try to read a good selection or representative sample of them. But uh, great insights from folks. And I love that we have such a diverse amount of expertise in the audience as well. And thank you, Scott Johnson. Uh, that was really fun. I'm glad we did that. I am too. What a what an awesome guest. And I just, I, I could do this every time because <laughs> I, I love hearing about things that we just don't know about yet or things that kind of change or the way we think about the technology around us. And she was just awesome. So yeah, yeah. Really, really good show today. So follow uh, Scott, twitter.com slash Scott Johnson. Head over to frogpants.com. You can find more than just the daily tech news show there. I don't think anyone thinks of it that way, frankly. But uh, yeah, there's all kinds of great shows. If you haven't explored it for some reason, go check it out. Uh, what's what, what's happening these days that you want to let people know about? For well, sure? I'm excited about a thing that I may as well just slip here. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the artist who works a lot on DC comic books by the name of Howard Porter uh, or Jerry Conway, a the gentleman responsible for the death of Gwen Stacy in the comic books. And I do know Jerry Conway, yeah. Uh, yes, he created The Punisher, uh, all kinds of characters you know and love, Man-Thing, I could keep going, Firestorm. Uh, those two and I have something in common. That is we're all going to be working on a big almost 14-year, 15-year compilation of my comic strip at myextralife.com. We're going to finally make a book 
Uh, we're getting it forward from Jerry. We're getting the cover from Howard, and it's already amazing, and you guys should see it. You're going to die. We're going to run a Kickstarter, and uh, I know people, a lot of people out there who are excited about my artwork are excited about the idea of collecting it all in one place. So finally, after years and years of requests, that's happening. So to keep track of that and how that's going, keep track of frogpants.com or my Twitter account at, my, at uh, Scott Johnson, and uh, it'll be soon. Like we're talking. It's the comic that birthed an empire. <laughs> well, it sort of did. I mean, a lot yeah. of it was my first foray into saying, I wonder if I could do stuff online. And um, it turned into so much more. But I'm so proud of that. I'm, I'm so happy to, to take what I think are the definitive comics during that period, put them all in one big place, and hopefully warm somebody's coffee table somewhere. So uh, watch for that. At Scott that Johnson on Twitter. That. Yep, it'll be good. Yeah. Uh, again, special thanks to Dr. Alicia Zhang of UCLA. Uh, if, if you're on Twitter, uh, go give her a follower. Follower. A follower, as <laughs> we used to say in Southern Illinois. L-I-X-I-A-Z. Uh, and if, if you liked uh, the appearance, tell her thanks for being on Daily Tech News Show. Uh, Patreon.com slash Ace Detect if you want to support the show. Uh, thanks to everybody, every one of our patrons, our bosses, our co-executive producer level supporters, uh, and the folks who just toss us some coin over PayPal. You all are the best. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash support to keep the show going and growing and being able to do more things like we did today. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash support. Our email address is feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. You can give us a call 512-59-DAILY. That's 512-593-2459. Listen to the show live at AlphaGeekRadio.com Monday through Friday at 4.30 Eastern. And visit our website, DailyTechNewsShow.com. We'll be back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. The show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this broker. <laughs> Always makes me laugh a little bit. Ah, oh, great. Good show, everybody. What should we call this? I think we should call this the show that Roger did a ton of hard work and created an excellent show. I agree. <laughs> also... <laughs> also, I have a bunch of titles. <laughs> well done, um, Roger. Yeah, really. Gosh. Oh, my. It came um, through. Yeah. Gosh, it, it just worked. It was great. Um, so, would you like to hear some titles? Because the <laughs> chat room responded to an excellent episode by coming up with some truly bodacious titles. Ooh. All right. All right. So, in the lead from BioCow, we have. All about that name, about that name, no server. <laughs> uh, then, throwback, we have TVZ gone, you down with NDN? Yeah, TCPIP. <laughs> um, and then we get Shakespeare from Zeladir, which is, what SSH through yonder window break? Nice! Oh, it's so good. Uh, yes. uh, and then uh, in the threes, we have BioCows, the torrentization of the internet. Dark Redeemer, Data by Any Other Name. I mean, more Shakespeare. Um, and then, let's see, IP addresses are so 2014. Oh, and a personal favorite of mine from Dark Redeemer. What's he's got in his packets, precious? <laughs> 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 so, those are some hot titles, let me tell you. Good luck. I could name that document in zero IP addresses. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Uh, a data by any other name. All right. Here's a lot. What SSH through yonder windows I breaks mean, is so good, but I really, really want to name it after NDN because we have so many good NDN ones. Yeah. I feel bad for Zeladir though, because that is I'll put killer. Them in, no, I'm going to put them in the show notes after Roger does them because uh, titles cannot go unheralded. No, it'd be a crime, really. It'd be a crime. Absolutely. Title crime, but not a word crime. <laughs> so wait, what? So if we do go NDN, which one should we go with? All about that um, name. Yeah, or just because it says NDN, you down with NDN? But uh, I, I just love all about that name, about that name, no servers. With it, with that one, yeah, you down with NDN? It should be no TCP/IP. Yeah. So that's hard. And we've definitely done the down with. Yeah. OPP. I think it's the Megan Trainer reference. I really do. It's yeah. the winner. It's also the winner on Showbot. I mean, if you disagree, yeah. Showbot.tv right now. Yeah. I'm still levelating. Yeah. 
That was a great show. Is, Seriously. That's your version of the QVC countdown clock. <laughs> I only <laughs> have another later. 10 minutes to sell you this. That's Watch. True. Make your choice now. Call. Oh, the leveling is done. Let's see who wins. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Too good. So, Roger, who you got on tap for tomorrow? <laughs> no for my next trick. I will get you the president of the United States of America. Yeah, could That's you like get President Obama? The hardest one I ever had to do was... Uh, was the Navy? I was trying to get someone for the Navy because oh. I was that to... for the uh, when you did the air the the airplanes? No, this one was for um, someone asked like, "Can I?" I wanted to give my son a laptop before he shipped off with the submarine fleet, and uh, I want to know if you can use it. And so I had to go through four and a half layers of Pentagon bureaucracy before I actually got someone yeah. in PACCOM in uh, Hawaii. On and the they... side. Sorry, go ahead, but there's oh, no, a plus no, no. side to military booking, which is they don't play games. No, they, they don't. don't. They don't play morning news games. They show up when they say they're going to show up. The people show up on time, and they do a great job. So it's like, you know, everybody else in the world plays booking games. Like, well, I'm on Today Show. I'm on GMA. I'm on this. I'm on that. Nope. The U.S. military, they just show up. Yeah. Oh, they have a whole office dedicated to that. Like, that's a goal. Ooh, find yourself ooh BioCow just put another one in the chat room. You down with NDN, right. no more IP. Ooh. Oh. That's not bad. It's punny as hell. Yeah. Wait, what's the pun? You, you down with Sorry. OPP? Yeah, you know me. Yeah. Every last homie. Sorry. It happens. Because there is a part of me, and I've been trying to keep that part of me silent, that's saying, well, it's not actually that there are no servers. You still have servers in an NDN implementation. They just aren't as uh, necessary. Or uh, <laughs> that, part of, that part of you cracks me up. <laughs> well, they're, 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 it's, it's become, it's interesting, interesting enough that it becomes more, more transparent, but less um, relevant to you as the end user. I think I might want to go with you down with NDN, no more IP. That's really good. That's really good. You could talk me out of it. I can't do it. Nope. Okay. No, I'll put it. all the other. Yeah, I'll put all the other uh, ones in the show notes at some point because they're that good. They're <laughs> just that good. Oh, what SSH three under Windows? That points. is that's genius. So that, that's going to be echoing around in my head for the next day. I'm a sucker for a good protocol joke, and we had lots of them today. You should get a protocol droid. <laughs> it's an app for uh, your phone. Do you speak bocce? No, but I... So, no, he speaks bocce, and I was like, no, I need someone that understands the language of moisture evaporators. And I was saying, it's like, it's just a machine. Why do you need to really kind My of My first job was programming it? binary load lifters. Quite similar to your oh, I forget. I almost well, had it. To your evaporators in most respects. Yeah. Except uh, that I'm, the return I'm, command is actually run to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even no more IP is not true because you can use IP on the Ethernet level of the stack. It just shifts down. Yeah. That quiets a room. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah totally. <laughs> That's the way to end your set on stage. <laughs> said, folks, I'll be here all week. Yep. Uh, we should do that. That should be a sketch at Nerdtacular. Yeah, that'd be all right. Like, just, like, somebody who gets up and, and they're not even jokes. Yeah. They're just, like, statements, really, like, super geeky statements. Yeah, like, hey, Tom Merritt on the stage uh, is good, is practicing a stand-up routine. Tom, take it away. Everyone will clap for you. And then you just get up there and go, uh... Ram. <laughs> so I had a friend who said they were going to email me. Um, you're verbing a noun. You send an email. You don't actually email. There's no protocol called email. And then we'll have someone go behind you. And there'll be nothing. No one will hear a thing. There'll be not a peep in there. And then people will laugh, though. I'd tell you a UDP joke, but I'm afraid you wouldn't get it. But I'm <laughs> yeah, I have to do some kind of opener before the band on uh, Friday. Maybe I'll do something. Uh, that's pretty fun. You want to you want a tag team? Yeah, we could totally have some fun with that. 
We should think about that. Are you up for something like that? Totally. Okay. Yeah. We'll think of small we'll put our heads together. Dude, I put myself in a blanket. <laughs> <laughs> I probably didn't even need to ask. Yeah, yes, last year. So I when I saw that I was like, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> and here she is still with us. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Oh, Good stuff. Good times. I am off to go get my kid from his last day at school. Oh, wow. Until next year. Summer break. Yeah, summer break starts today. Not really. Yeah. Real. Tomorrow's uh, my daughter's graduation. Uh, oh, yeah. I loved the uh, the announcement. That was so good. Oh, thanks. Yeah, we're uh, my oldest daughter took the pictures and did a really good job. Um, but anyway, yeah, I'm going to go down there. We're going to, they're doing it where the jazz play. So we're at the, uh, the E center or the E solution center or the hell it's called. So big MBA thing for this giant school thing. And it's going to kind of suck. You're going to bring noisemakers and. Yeah. I was thinking about Vu, uh, Vuvuzelas or whatever Vuvuzelas. the hell they're called. Yeah. There yeah. you go. Just through the Let's entire see. thing. <laughs> Maybe uh, I can go home. That'd be really obnoxious. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> I thought it would kill me. Anyway. Um, hey, Scott, I put something atrociously ridiculous in the story pool. Oh, did you know? It's just beyond, it's not even really usable, but it's it's just there. You'll see it. You'll know. Pull it up now. Yeah. Let's I'm see. just saying. Well, that, that's a happens, tease to listen to the morning know, stream if I, I ever heard one. Have, I know, you may not, it may not work, but uh, I... I, Tune in and find out. Yeah. Will Scott use the too hot for podcasting link provided by Jenny Josephson? It's, There's only one way to know. know. It's Where pretty is, retro. Uh, let's see. Hold on. It's the one with the, with the giant block of text next to, to the right of the... Oh, Chinese restaurant I, one? Yeah, but don't... <laughs> just look to the right of it. Okay, hold on. <laughs> That's a reaction. Okay. It's a it's sort of a challenge to you, but I don't know. <laughs> it's sort of like the greatest challenge of all time, but I don't know if it's good. I don't know. It's I there. Can use this. This is pretty funny. Yeah, you, you're under no obligation, but it just happened. It, I don't know what happened. It just happened. It's Jenny's story selection version of "Come Here." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is not. Too far from the truth. All right. Oh, my goodness. All right. Anyway. That's awesome. Nice work. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, go pick up your kid yeah, before I'm it gets any worse. I'll talk to you guys later. Uh, all right. Thanks, Scott. I'll talk to you soon. See you. Cool. Thank you very much. Bye. Um, I do have a question for you, either one of you. Mm -hmm. So when you guys record the audio, you, you're, getting, um, you're getting levels on it, and they're, they're not clipping on your end. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's true. Is that, oh, is that a yes or a no? That Wait, is a I'm yes. Sorry, I, missed, okay. I missed the question. Oh, no, it's when you guys record the audio for the show, you're making sure that the audio is in clipping on, oh, the, yeah. on, on the feed. Cause that's yeah. what the levelator does. Because when, when I was working with um, the show last night, uh, I noticed that um, uh, Patrick's audio was a little clippy. Okay. Like it was we made him turn it up, too. So we, made him, oh, okay. we may have made him turn it up too far. Yeah. The problem is I don't have a good, and maybe, Roger, you know one. I don't actually have a good live level checker. The that, only ones I've ever used were um, video editors, but there, mm -hmm. there has to be... Basically, I always cheat it, and I always uh, drop it uh, from wherever it's at by minus six, just to give it yeah. headroom. So, and it's not because the the media or the the median audio will be like minus twelve or whatever. It's because sometimes people will cough or do something, and it'll spike it, and that just gets it. I can always kind of amp it up in post. I was, I mean, his, he, you can hear him, but it's 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 noticeably kind of um, um, a little distorted. On, on well, his well you know, the distortion may not have been clipping because we were having, we were trying to get oh. rid of a little bit of, of line noise that wasn't vol, it wasn't gain or volume related. It was just, uh, and we had him, we had him turn down a little bit and then we had him unplug and replug. Mm. 
so I don't know. It may have just been, it may have been his, his setup because he's on the road and he was in his, I guess, his in-laws' house on on a DSL on a lower bandwidth DSL connection. The Beja Mobile. Yeah. No, it's just it's something I noticed yesterday. Yeah, it's hard to know because we it's always like you're adjusting the levels for AGR based on what the chat room is saying and then it sounds weirder on YouTube. Uh, it's like there's a lot of we need we need ourselves a proper video editor. Hmm. How Ooh. would we get one of those, Jenny? Hmm. I don't know. It's a goal. Yeah, it's a goal. It's we definitely. all have goals. And ours is twenty thousand dollars. Doesn't uh, wire oh, you use Wirecast right to grab the audio, or is you using? Hmm. I'm just trying audio to think. Of, I'm I'm trying to oh audio hijack that doesn't have a not a VU meter but an actual uh, um, dB FS meter. It might. You know, it Actually. doesn't really. It doesn't have a good enough one. It like it doesn't show you spikes. I don't think. There are I've a never whole found it. There's a VU meter uh, thing here that you can put in. Let me try recording something. Yeah. Um, okay. Now, where do I see it? Yeah, that was always my issue. Oh. What? When you talked, the meters... Oh, it's only from incoming audio. Oh, because I only have it on the... In no, hold on. I put it in the wrong place. That's why. There we go. So, yeah, they're not very good. They're not even graded. Uh, uh, and then it has menu bar meters that you can put in. But no, but no DB. It's so yeah. weird. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things that... Uh, that um, I've, Not on your show, but uh, I've noticed in some other shows that... Um, like a, a v, not a VU DB meter would help. Yeah, for sure. But the the good thing about it for you guys is you all have really good mics, and so that is less of an issue. Mm -hmm. Generally, you know, if you use a cheaper mic or a lav or something, they tend to blow out. <laughs> blow out. Well, I uh, I don't know about you guys, but I think that show was a success. It was a great show. I liked it. Not just yeah, because it was awesome. another first Asian person I've seen on the show in a while. Um, well, you don't watch your own shows, I guess. Well, that's just like looking in a mirror. <laughs> a little, <laughs> somewhat narcissistic, incredibly vague. <laughs> <laughs> my wife, Jen, always nags me when I'm looking at myself in the mirror. And it's like I'm brushing my teeth. What are you nagging me for? Yeah, if you're brushing your teeth, that's one thing. If you're Joker. just looking we fondly just, at yourself, well, it's also what's wrong with I, that? I also tell her to feel my biceps as feel they're getting bigger. That's just... <laughs> uh, well, I think our work here is done. Cool. Yeah. yeah. All so, right. Jenny, are you doing the video or am I doing the video? Well, let's we'll we'll, we'll, we'll hold hold that thought, Roger. Hold that thought. Stay tuned, folks, for Coverville uh, coming up on most of these Frog Pants networks immediately following Uncovered Village, dedicated to naturist netcasting.